Alright, what we are going to be doing today is we are going to be looking through all of the features of the Eldritch Culture. Now first we're going to make it so that we can quickly age up, and we are going to choose Azathoth as our major god. So now we're going to go through Athalach Natra, Nug and Yeb, and finally Nilathotep. Now we're going to go through each of the myth units in turn. Uh, the myth unit for Atalach Natcha is the Spider of Lang. It poisons enemies uh, constantly as its main form of attack. It can still attack buildings, but it will not poison them, of course. Uh, it can also poison heroes. It is worth noting that it is a stronger unit than it should be, due to the fact that a unit it is killed will still be alive for some degree of time. So it can kill many units over time that have already killed it. The myth unit for Nug and Yab is called the Unraveler. The Unraveler cannot attack at all, has no defenses, but it can eat. And so its general purpose is to go to an enemy gold mine or enemy trees and eat constantly, replenishing its HP. Um. The myth unit for uh, New Arthotep is the Faceless One. It begins looking like this, where it's basically useless, but you can transform it into a unit that bucks every unit around it, like the Battle Boar, uh, which does a considerable amount of both hack and crush damage, a very swift bird that is also very weak, and a wizard. And the wizard is a ranged attacker. You can transform between them all at will, completely freely, making micro very interesting when you're trying to use them. However, it is worth noting that, aside from the bird, Every single one of them has a creation animation, meaning that you can't do anything with them instantly after creating them, except for escape with the bird. Now, let's move on to the god powers. The god power for Azathoth creates a ring. A ring that is, un that is unescapable unless if there's a unit that blocks it. So in this particular case, we have positioned it correctly, and there is no way to escape. Any unit inside will be trapped. This can be very useful when you are defending your villagers from a raid, or you are attacking with archers and don't want them to be attacked in return. The myth unit, uh, the god power for Atlachanacha is Spinner's Call. If we have uh, some number of training ground units, those being the classical age human units, we can use this and transform them into spider variants of themselves, which are all myth units, are uh, significantly stronger, but also completely fail when exposed to heroes. The god power for Nug and Yab, which we cannot see right now. Uh, we will have to see that later. Alright, let's move on to the cultists then. Normal cultists, as we saw before, transform into forms that generate favor. Cultists of Azathoth generate into... Well, that's Atlas Natcha, whoops. Cultists of Azathoth turn into things that are very similar to Plenty Vaults, except extremely easily destroyed, and they pay for themselves in precisely two and a half minutes. Um, cultists of Atlas Natcha can turn into spiders, of, uh, sorry, daughters of Atlas Natcha, which can move relatively quickly, have decent attack. However, they can also transform using one wood into holes. These holes, as you can see on the minimap, are brown, looking like Gaia units, and they do not generate enemy aggression. This means you can use them to infiltrate the enemy camp, and then revert into their scorpion man form when you need them to. Next, uh, Cultists of Nilathotep, they can turn into geometric mages. Geometric mages, as per the very famous story, are able to completely transcend normal realms and walk through basically anything. Now, form of the Gaiothan, this is the Nug and Yeb cultist form. These are very swift cavalry that are not particularly useful against anything but siege units. They will destroy siege units. Next up, let's go to the voices. Voice of Azathoth is just a reasonably powerful voice. All voices, of course, can, uh, can empower temples, but nothing else. Uh, exceptions, of course, are things like the voice of Atlat Nasha, which can empower training grounds. We can also have the voice of Nug and Yeb, which you can spend one favor to summon an area attack around them. Uh, and then the voice of Nilathotep, who is able to convert enemy soldiers and villagers. Anyways, now that the rain is stopped, we can go back to guard powers. The guard power for Nug and Yeb is Pillars of Irem, which summons a large sandstorm wherever they are. That is to counterbalance. It is a very strong guard power, which is to counterbalance the fact that its myth unit cannot attack. Next, Nilathotep can, a voice Nilathotep can be confirmed into an incarnation of Nilathotep, which cannot attack, but will convert enemy units extremely quickly. 
these things are similar to the sign of Osiris in that it is extremely beneficial for you to take them down as quickly as possible. However, they cannot deal much damage on their own and require backup. They cannot particularly defend as well, and despite being a hero, are very weak to myth units due to the fact that they cannot attack or convert them. Anyways, let's move on to our uh, human units. First we see the Lunatic, which is reasonably expensive and actually has a small cavalry bonus. Huntsman is a very cheap archer, but is also very weak and has a very short range comparatively. However, they do move reasonably quickly, especially if you worship a Thakwa. Ravagers are standard cavalry, uh, not much special about them. Next we're going to be seeing the Heroic Age units. The Heroic Age units start with the Brutal, which are strong but very slow uh, units that are good against infantry. Uh, shiners are long-range and inaccurate archers that are very good against siege units and ships. Stoneskins are well-armored infantry that are similar to Huskarls, except that they don't actually get uh, any anti-archer damage, and they're a bit stronger. Well, except against archers. Devourers are siege units that are also very good against infantry, and also any units that are slow enough to be trapped by them. Uh, they are quite powerful, but they are also very expensive. Star throwers are much cheaper, and are also extremely inaccurate, but can melt buildings and have a slight bonus against myth units. They also fire a large number of projectiles. If you're standing still and being attacked by them, you are probably in danger. The only real counter is to get close because their minimum range is quite large, so there's only a sweet spot at which they can actually fire. Now let's move on to the Mythic Age human units. The Mythic Age human units must be trained from the Grand Temple, which is a very expensive building, and each of them has special properties. First of all, they can only be improved by the medium, heavy, and champion of their type. Normal infantry, archer, and cavalry upgrades do not apply to them. Secondly, they all cost favor, and the upgrades all cost favor. Thirdly, each of them has a special effect. The Yith Possessed, for example, are extremely strong units, but they are only as strong as the number that you have of them. So, for example, if I make another one, you can see that they get weaker. And if I make the maximum number, that being 13, we can see that they actually become fairly frail, both in attack and defense. However, when they die, they get stronger again. Now we have the God Rider. God Riders are cavalry that can jump into combat and have a very strong anti-cavalry bonus. Penguin Fletched are archers that receive a considerably higher than average elevation bonus. Uh, they also do good damage against all human soldiers. However, they do very little against myth units and heroes. They also have a significant range, but their attack isn't amazing. Uh, unlike the Gastafides, they do not have crush damage. Now, let's move on to different gods and different myth units. So, choosing Yogg's Thoth now. And quickly advancing to the next stage, we will choose Yithakwa, then we will choose Dagon, and finally we will choose Haster. Now, the god power for uh, Yogg's Thoth is similar to Vision in that you can cast it anywhere, but not similar in that it creates an actual unit that does the spying for you. The, eye, the line of sight is much lower than vision, however it can be attacked and destroyed. A good use of this in my experience has been placing them over gold mines. Similarly, you can take cultists of yogg Sothoth and turn them into much weaker flying versions. You'll be able to see the line of sight shortly. In addition, uh, well, actually, let's, let's, let's just move on to the voices then. Uh, voice of Yogg's Thoth are much better at empowering and can empower libraries, which train rituals and all of the uh, guide upgrades, except for those that are trained at attainted town centers. Essentially, the way that divine upgrades work is each guide has two of them, except for your major guide, which only has one, and they can be trained at the library. In addition, each one of them has a unique tech that can only be trained at an attainted town center, which must be started by a cultist. It is worth noting that attainted town centers provide significantly less population and do not have as good a range. However, they do do crush damage, making them much better against buildings. Each of these techs is expensive, but also very strong. Now, anyways, back to it. Uh, 
If Aqua's guard power is Howling Gale, which can pick up units and harmlessly fling them over barriers. So for example, I can fling all of my townsfolk and cultists over a tree line. This also works on enemies, of course. Uh, if Aqua's myth unit is a Wendigo, which is a very fast unit, even though it is somewhat weak, that can shriek at the beginning to boost the attack of nearby Wendigo. This also boosts the attack of Voices of Ithaqua. And Voices of Ithaqua have a special ability where they can summon a lightning bolt on the opponent, which, due to the fact that I do not have the animating skills necessary for this, just takes the form of the normal centaur charge range attack uh, perfect shot. Like so. Anyways, moving on. Uh, Pull of the Deep is Dagon's power, which essentially takes enemy ships and makes them vanish for a little while. Oh, goodbye. So for example, I could use it on these fishing ships here and remove them for a short period of time. It is worth knowing that the hitboxes still exist. However, the ships themselves will not return and cannot attack and cannot be attacked for a little while. However, your own ships will still attempt to attack them, meaning it isn't just an easy way to automatically destroy an enemy's navy, or that your own ships will ignore them and can then focus on the fishing ships in the area should they return. The myth unit, uh, is the youth right now. The myth unit for the Gon is the deep one. These are very cheap myth units, and although they have a decent attack, they do fail pretty hard against ships, especially the Argo. Now, when these ships return, we will see that these are able to convert enemy fishing ships and enemy docks. Like so. Because, of course, this is a cheat code uh, gameplay, they converted them extremely quickly. Now, the voice of Dagon is simply an amphibious uh, voice, so it can go on both land and water, and can also empower docks. Now, the cultist of... I should mention the cultist of Athakwa, Cultists of Athakwa can't actually hunt, so they can successfully hunt, but most cultists can't gather resources. The form of the hunter is a ranged cultist that not only has a good pierce attack, but also hunts extremely quickly. Anyways, moving on to the cultist of Dagon. Cultist of Dagon can turn into amphibious cultists, and amphibious cultists can gather fish. They do so slightly uh, worse than fishing ships, However, they also have a melee attack. That being said, fishing ships do, in fact, have a strong melee attack. However, in order to use this, you must first research half one fishermen. And they can only attack other fishing ships and docks. As we can see, cultists can happily gather fish. Uh, in addition, their ritual allows them to gather fish even on land, although I still say that Dagon is only a god you should worship if you have large water play. Anyways, on to the final one. Uh, Hastur has a very unique god power. Hastur's god power essentially allows you to take a cultist of Hastur and turn it into a living plague. Uh, when that cultist gets over there, I'll show you exactly how that happens. Although, normal cultists of Hastur... Here we are. They essentially, you can spend one favor and turn them into healing blood. The myth unit for Hastur is the yellow one which has two forms, a weak healing form with fast regeneration, and a strong attacking form, which constantly loses HP over time. Now, with this, you can transform freely between them, meaning you can heal in the midst of a battle. However, be warned, the yellow ones in healing form are very easily killed, especially by heroes, as the hack armor is terrible and the pierce armor isn't great. Besides, they have only 50 HP. Um, the yellow ones in attack form can tank a considerable amount of damage, but you will still want to retreat them, if possible, before turning them into their healing form. Whoa. Cultists of ha sorry, Voices of Hasta have a unique ability, which causes them to deal low-level damage to anything around them that's not uh, you yourself or one of your allies. Uh, we, we cannot use play while it's raining, so I'm just going to demonstrate uh, the Voice of Hasta's effect on Dia and maybe also this. Yep, see? You can see the attack that it is doing upon the deer. 
In order to counterbalance this very powerful ability, uh, the voice of Hasta moves slower and has significantly lower hack armor, meaning that if you get close to it, you can usually kill it. Now let's see if I can find where the enemy human soldiers are. Ah, perfect. Plague transforms one of your cultists. Oh. Uh, Plague transforms one of your cultists of Hasta into the patient zero of an extremely violent epidemic. And I will actually make sure this one gets there this time. Uh, but what this does is essentially it spreads all the way throughout your opponent's human units with walking mushrooms that spread the plague further. There are two things you can do to avoid being harmed by this particular plague. Uh, one of them is kill every one of your units around the area as soon as you notice, although sometimes it can be too late. And the other is wall up and make the uh, plague mushrooms unable to come close to you. So we will soon see the effect as it spreads. There we go. These elephants are unfortunately all going to succumb to the plague because the AI does not know how to not succumb to the plague. Uh, if there were more human units in the area, then these very bushes would probably have a higher chance of spreading the plague and walking. But even so, one or two of them might be able to walk all the way over here and infect the farmers. An important thing about the civilization that I have not mentioned so far is every single one god power has a, an, essentially an invoker. So each invoke, each time you use a god power, you can then re-invoke it. However, some mythic age god powers do not have this, for example, Hasters. And, in fact, Plague cannot be invoked. Now let's move on to the final gods. Shabnigarath has some very unusual bonuses, uh, which we will discuss later. Among them the fact that their cultists can gather from herd animals without killing them. So they can gather and still the animal will fatten. Uh, moreover, they can transform into goats with meat that do not decay at a considerable markup. However, you still do need to pay the favor cost, which takes time. Now, in addition, these goats have meat that does not decay. Now let's age up. Oh dear, I just did a thakwa. Well, that's okay, we can always do uh, the final god later. Anyways. Voices of Shabnigarath yeah, yeah, act as food repositories and can train black births. Black births are very short-lived myth units that can also be trained for maws. The god power of Shabnigarath allows you to place a maw, which essentially is a completely free, uh, all-resource dump that can also train black births to defend re villagers from raids. Uh, the invoker of maw is only two favor, meaning that it is a very cheap god power that can be used very rapidly. Next we will look at uh, Yig. Yig's god power is a short-range curse that turns villagers into snakes, either three normal villagers or one Atlantean villager. Uh, similar to Yig's focus on killing economic units, the Serpent of Yig is a unit that can swallow enemy villagers whole. It is only really good against them, however you can improve them significantly and make them more useful against generic units by using Feeding Frenzy in order to double their attack and make them move significantly faster. However, they still are mostly used, uh, mostly useful against villagers as raiding units. Next, uh, the voice of Yidra can create a large burst of power, uh, very similar to the Nemean Lion Roar. Note that Yidra is the wife of Yig, and voices of Yig do not exist in the game. Now we will move on to Cthulhu. Cthulhu has the Shoggoth, which starts at half HP and increases its HP, healing in fact, every time it hits a unit. It cannot be healed through normal means. Uh, in addition, it can throw human units that it uh, gets too close to, although that acts more as a debuff due to the fact that it will not heal from this and be vulnerable during this time. In addition, its hack armor is not incredibly great, so getting close to them is probably the best bet for dealing with them. Now we will deal with the voice of Cthulhu. The voice of Cthulhu has a Hekagajantes uh, pound on the ground, and it blasts myth units back. And the voice and the cultist of Cthulhu has a very unusual ability. This ability we will soon see, uh, and it also features in the god power, so I'm going to make several more of them and send them over here.
essentially, with a Cultist of Cthulhu, uh, it is a myth unit. So it has a much stronger attack and defenses in addition to more HP. However, it does cost favor to produce, making them roughly, in my opinion, 20% uh, more expensive than the average cultist. And of course, they fall to, to heroes, so we will soon see that. However, we can transform them using 30 favor into extremely powerful, very high DPS units that are particularly good against other myth units, of course. However, that is not the extent of their abilities. While in the Endbringer form, which, which dies in, I believe, six seconds, we can transform them. Oh, it's raining. Alas, I should have noticed that. Anyways, once it finishes raining, we will use the end god power, which is the most powerful god power. And it will surely annihilate everything in this general area. Uh, one of the reasons why it is so powerful is it does not have a damage cap, meaning that at no point is it safe. It also will destroy practically any building inside of it, except for town centers, wonders, titan gates, and titans. In five seconds, we will experience it for ourselves. Transform into the Endbringer. It's also with only they are highly aggressive in the state. And there we go. Very little can survive this. It lasts for quite a time too, meaning that it is a very effective way of completely closing off a location, and also meaning that if your enemy starts sending cultists of Cthulhu into your army, uh, you might want to focus fire them even before you attack other units, especially if they turn into the Endbringer form. If they turn into the Endbringer form, you have to destroy them as quickly as possible. Now, finally, we will get into our last god. Now, this god has an unusual god power. Essentially, in order to use it, you must first build statues of lightning, which are significantly weaker than normal statues of lightning, of course. Then, you may use the god power and activate their attack. So if an enemy attacks you, you can turn, use the god power to turn all of the statues you have henceforth built into your advantage. Moreover, the cultists can turn into essentially uh, short-range detonators, which can deal significant amounts of damage, particularly to myth units. Moreover, uh, it's the attainted turn side attack. Using Sathagwa's uh, uh, tainted Town Center technology, we can significantly improve the form of blood, making it now move much faster, able to chase enemies, shortening its lifetime so enemies have less time to react, and improving its damage. In addition, uh, the myth unit is Formless Spawn, which essentially is a slime-like thing that can garrison inside itself for significant attack benefits. Essentially, if it is garrisoned inside, it, it causes 10 crush damage, well, if they are ungarrisoned, each one of them only has five, so you really want them to be as garrisoned as possible. Essentially, this means that the optimal strategy is to let them get damaged, degarrison, then immediately regarrison into a different one that is undamaged. However, if one of them is killed, all of them spread out and suddenly become weak targets, uh, meaning you need to essentially reform your one-bodied slime. Now, another important feature of this particular civilization is its ability to use rituals. Now, these three rituals are the same for all uh, major gods. These three rituals correspond to your major god, and each of these three correspond to each of your minor gods. Now, each of these are very powerful, but they do not discriminate. So, for example, if I build a ritual of lightning, it will kill my own units just as happily as it will those of my opponents. Which means it is often a good idea to destroy it if your units are the only ones in the general vicinity. Now, another important one to consider is altars. Altars essentially sacrifice your own cultists much, much better than you can do it on the road. So as soon as you can make altars, it is generally a good idea to do so as this represents the next stage in your favor economy. 
and I will let you discover for yourself what each of these rituals do. The final thing I will mention is the town hall. The town hall is a unit is essentially a building that replaces the need for healers. So for example, if your units become damaged, you can garrison them inside the town hall, and you can spend five favor to sacrifice everything inside of them. After everything inside of them has been sacrificed in exchange for a significant sum of favor, you can then almost instantly rebuild it. This is essentially the way that we deal with injured units here, because whatever other civilization would attempt to heal them, we just sacrifice them as they have lived beyond their expectations. The only form of healing for this civilization comes in the form of cultists to pastor, and if you don't have them, then you're just completely out of luck. And in fact, Azathoth cannot worship pastor at all. Anyways, that is a good summary of this particular culture, and I hope that you will play test it and let me know if you find any bugs or any balance issues.